Speaking of the fact that everything is broken right now, people are saying Nefiri broken, Master E broken, everything is broken. Chat, I'ma keep it real. Shit ain't broken. Stuff has been broken years ago when we had crazy seasons. When we had uh, some questionable items that were so broken that they had to be removed. And uh, good guy Axel gave us a video, right? Wants you to forget the most insane year in League of Legends. Season 5 retrospective. I don't agree with season 5. I say season 3 was the most OP, but maybe it's close. So let's see. Do you remember the craziest season of League of Legends? Yes. A year that saw more broken champions than ever before. Yes. An untouchable Kalista who kited your entire team and point and click one shots from one of the oldest champions in the game. A that was ability power Warwick, by the way. Your entire team and point. That's point and click Warwick ability power. Now that was fun. And click one shots from one of the oldest champions in the game. A meta that involves three people on your team taking smite, a brand new summoner's rift, and extra game mode set in Bilgewater and a UI update so disliked that it was almost immediately reverted. In the span of 12 months from December Wait, I don't remember the uh, update. December 2014 to December 2015, League went through more changes than ever. Some of your <sighs> Chat, let's get some Fs in the chat. A moment of silence. Sword of the Occult, which was uh, AD version of Magi's. With Magi's, they're getting a build, the power. With that, you were getting AD. Also stacks. The Fire Grasp. You press a button, then in the next 3 seconds, your damage is multiplied by 1000. And a Mana Potion. My heart, my soul. Gone, but not forgotten. And then people ask me, Shifa, why you wear glasses? That's why, so people wouldn't see me crying. Favorite items were removed. Many of the game's splash arts were updated. Major game-breaking reworks, like a version of Mordekaiser bot lane that could summon the freaking dragon. <laughs> yep, Dragon Mordekaiser was a thing. This guy was the most popular creator for the game by a lot. Also, if you don't know who this guy is, that's my boy, I'm a cutie pie, best ADC ever. And he's the one who came up with the quote. If you don't know what the f*** are you doing, then how are your opponents supposed to know what the f*** are you doing? That's the one. That's the creator. Long shot. And Faker, the greatest player of all time, had to fight to keep his job as his team benched him for another player. This is the year that League grew into what it is today, for better or for worse. And when I think about some of the greatest stories in League history, I can almost guarantee that it happened during Season 5. As fruitful. And there's the death mark coming in. And will it be enough? The pop and the ignites! Better than what one v ones Faker! We begin our journey at the 2014 World Championship, which was a truly special tournament. The hype song was legendary at nearly 400 million views on YouTube. Warriors by Imagine Dragons is without a doubt the most iconic world song that Riot has ever done. This group, the song is so good that they made another world song that is an exact copy of Warriors. Just saying. World Championship was played in South Korea and featured some incredible moments like expect a Z outplay against Dade's Talon. Looper locking in his famous singe. Insect whipping out the pocket pick fiddlesticks in a critical game. And it all culminated with an incredible finals where Samsung White, led by guys like Pawn, Mata, and Dandy, defeated Uzi, Insect, and the rest of Royal Club to win the Season 4 World Championship. I fully believe that if this wasn't such an incredible World Championship, the esports scene for this game would be a fraction of what it is today. Many fans were officially hooked on League Esports for life. And true that now to think about it, I have friends who casually play League of Legends once or twice a month, you know, who don't give a fuck about the game. But when the world's finals are up, bro, we are glued to our screens. We're watching championships on Twitch, YouTube, wherever. We are number one fan of League of Legends. That's what we do. When the walls are up, mm, brother, we're watching that. But then, after that, casually playing our stuff? Nah. Images of the stadium in South Korea were used for years to convince naysayers and venture capitalists alike that the demand for esports is real. Seeing this World Cup football stadium get filled, hearing the crowd's reaction, all of it immaculate. The game has obviously grown a lot since late 2014, but this one moment, this tournament, 
all these years later, still feels like the peak of League of Legends to me. Not because it had the most players we'll ever see, but because the game itself felt unstoppable. I'd say to Season 3 was the peak. Yeah, but if I remember correctly, that this Season 3 was the peak and Season 4, we were going down already. At Season 4, we were going down slowly, Season 5 even lower, and then we went absolutely downhill. The hype for Season 5 was off the charts, and Riot had to deliver. And one of the big ways they wanted to do that was with a brand new map. In the summer of 2014, we saw the first preview of the new Summoner's Rift. The goal? Help out with visual clarity and bring the standard of the game closer to modern times. Yeah, that's what we got. We got a new map. I'm pretty sure we have viewers right now who don't even know, not even they don't remember, they don't realize we had an old map. Bro, that old map was so cringe. It was so nice. It was so cringe. We had the snow map on that old cringe map. Old map? Yeah, we had old map. By desaturating the background and the map textures and increasing the saturation of minions and champions, it helped more important things stand out from the background. You can even see in this first version they showed us just how much they wanted to do this. In the topside blue buff quadrant near Baron, the ground is basically gray. Thankfully, they didn't really stick with this overly desaturated look and brought back a good bit of the color since this first preview. Across the board, there were higher quality textures and more distinct models for the jungle monsters. For example, look at the red buff Brambleback compared to the old Lizard. The new cinematic entrances for Dragon and Baron were insanely cool, and the Dragon in general really needed a lot of help. This is a massive upgrade, and I still to this day have no idea why the old one was so small and dinky in the pit. Because it was the model that was fitting into ARAM, because we had our old tutorial in ARAM. One of the objectives of tutorial in League of Legends back then was to kill a fucking dragon. And he was in ARAM, because the map was ARAM. So if it was any bigger, it wouldn't fit. Just saying. This Summoner's Rift update was a massive success, so good that we're closing on nearly a decade still with this map, and Riot really hit the ball out of the park. But I will say, there are still a sizable amount of players who love the old map. Now I'm perfectly fine with saying this is Hey, if you love old map, which I do, just play Zillion, he feels very old. He literally stands out of the place in here. Flat out nostalgia, and most people seem to admit that as well, because clearly the new map is great. However, there is something to be said about the difference in theme. The old map was much more of a forest. There were trees everywhere, and the idea of being a jungler, a forester among those trees, with the hunter's machete, that theme felt really nice. With the new map, again, as great as it is, it's almost entirely full of stone, and like I said, it's by design. This was a creative decision to help improve on the visual clarity, but in doing so, I believe a bit of the magic of the old map was lost. Bro, the old red buff is so cringe. The visual clarity, but in- <laughs> That's the old red buff we had, and we had small minions. Like, what kind of creature is that, by the way? Doing so, I believe a bit of the magic of the old map was lost. All these new jungle monster upgrades weren't just purely cosmetic, as the role itself saw massive changes. Yeah, because we have Gromp right now. Before Gromp, we had a Wraith, a special Wraith. But before Wraith, we had nothing in there. It was an empty space in there. Out were classic items like Spirit of the Elder Lizard and Feral Flare, and in were the Smite enchantments. This was the first appearance of Chilling Smite and Challenging Smite, aka Red and Blue Smite, which yeah. ended up sticking around in the game for a very long time. But what were the other two? Purple Smite and White Smite? There was something called Poacher's Knife? How many- Poacher's Knife would give you more movement speed in the enemy jungle. Yeah, and you would deal more damage to enemy jungle camps. Not your own, so basically you were invading. But still, in comparison to Chilling Smite and to Red Smite, that Poacher's Knife didn't do shit. It wasn't worth it. How many of you have ever even seen this before? Let's start with the Ranger's Trailblazer, the Purple Smite. It had no bonus effects on champions, but it gave your smite some sustain and AoE, uh -huh. and this was the best for farming junglers who wanted to clear as quickly as possible. During this season, we would see blue, red, and purple smite all used at certain points. Each of them had their place, but the scavenging smite on poachers, practically nobody used it. This was a counter jungling smite that gave you a massive burst of movement speed, reduced the smite's cooldown, and gave you extra gold if it were used in the enemy jungle. Yeah, 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 that's the I remember this one. I do not remember the purple one, that's odd. It doesn't sound too bad at first, but in practice it was pretty mediocre, since in almost all cases it just made more sense to go for the rangers. You'll be more sustained, and the AoE smite helped clear the enemy camp quicker anyway. Another big change to the season 5 jungle was the idea that smiting camps would give temporary bonus 
bonuses. For example, if you smited the Krugs, you would gain additional CC when clearing other camps. Smiting the Gromp gave you a burn or a poison over time, smiting the Raptors would do a sweeper type of effect, and the Wolves granted a spirit that would help scout the jungle. Almost- Holy shit, I forgot all of that. I straight up forgot all of that. Bro, that was amazing. It's like a free Callista W. Throughout the entire history of League, I think that the 2015 jungle was truly my favorite. Speaking of the 2015 jungle, you knew I was going to talk about this, and here we are. When it comes to preseason screw-ups, this might be Riot's number one goof of all time. Which one? To say that Warwick benefited from the new jungle and Red Smite would be a lie. It was a total abomination. Oh yeah, Warwick, oh dear, and Vi, those three. <laughs> that was disgusting. This champ was the perfect storm of unbalanced. He was easy, he only cost 450, which by the way, back then was a huge deal since runes were not freaking free. Yeah, and those runes had tears. That's even better. So if your account was at level 10, you unlock the first tier of runes. So one rune, one small rune cost you, let's say, for example, a 50 blue essence. Back then it was called influence points. Back then it was IP, not blue essence. But still, the numbers remain the same. One rune would cost you around 50. You need to fill, I'm pretty sure, 30 in total. We had 27, yeah, free X9 of the small ones. And then we had the free major quintessences, which cost 1,000 each. So to have one rune page, which you cannot alter whatsoever, which costs you around three or four champions, by the way. And he was blatantly overpowered. All these factors played a role in him being one of the few times a champion has surpassed the 60% win rate mark. Here's the Warwick combo. You ready? I know it's really tough. Here we go. You would smite the enemy and press R. That's it. Most of... <laughs> that was the most brain dead Warwick we ever had. Lord, that was, that was fun time to play this game. At the time, this extremely simple two-button point-and-click combo was enough to nearly 100 to 0 almost all champions. Tanks included, by the way, because he had massive on-hit damage. Yep. I've heard people make the argument that this is the most overpowered champion ever. Not because he was technically the strongest. There have probably been versions of Cassidy or Zed that were in theory stronger, but due to the fact that Old Warwick was one of the easiest champions we've ever seen, if not the easiest, patch 420 Warwick became the most free low pick of all time. Cool. On the very next patch, he was nerfed, and to this day, this is still the funniest patch notes they've ever released. If you want some context on what Riot thought about Warwick, they say, we bet nobody saw this coming. We all know Warwick should be lower to peg, or two, or five. We're going to be monitoring Warwick heavily to see if we need to go harder, but we're confident that this reduces his power enough that you might be able to compete with him in games. 60% never forget. Big as seven. funny as this is, Riot also talks about win rate twice here, and it's fascinating to read this in today's game. Warwick's popularity and subsequent insanity in the win rate department, even though we don't like using win rate as a statistic because it's loaded with so many other variables. Now let's not talk about win rates again. Seriously though, win rates are a correlation of game health, not a cause. Gope. And that was all in the patch notes. I find this interesting because they are adamant in this post that win rate is not everything, almost aggressively taking action against the player to tell them that they should not be talking about win rates. But if we fast forward eight years later to today, the devs definitely don't see it like this. Not to say that we don't understand why Azir has a lower win rate in solo queue than Annie, I think we all know the reasons, but in most of Freak's rundowns of the patch notes, he's been using win rate as one of the major reasons for changes and game health. Most players and the Riot game designers are fully in tune with the current win rates on champions and do in fact use it as a point of discussion. Yeah, but this is where they're running into an issue, because at the end of the day, they have to focus for two or three groups of players. Number one, the elites who play in the LCS, LDAC, and, and other championships. The fakers of the world. Bro, they know the champion, ins and outs, they know every single number, they know absolutely everything. So understandably, that if you add, uh, for example, 10 plus damage to the rest of us, it doesn't mean shit. But to faker, he will abuse that. And the pro scene is going to be the meta of either you pick the champion or you ban the champion. Remember Zeriyumi, just saying, remember Aatrox, 
Just saying, that's what happened. But the problem is that we have two more groups. We have people who know how to play this game. We're talking about grandmasters. Okay, master plus, who know how to play this game. And then we have the rest of the plebs, which is 99.9% .9 of the population who have no idea how to play this game. We're just messing around, we're just having fun. And naturally, we don't give a fuck about these changes. So technically, if you give a champion to Faker, it's going to be OP. If you give a champion to someone who is our elo, you will not understand how to play this champion. So naturally, the win rate, for example, in bronze will drop. Let's take Azir. You're picking Azir, you're playing Azir in bronze. Even though they buff the same plus 10 damage, yeah, you have no fucking idea how to play Azir. So naturally, your win rate is going to be fucking 20% at best. Give that same Azir to Faker. His win rate skyrockets to 80%. Then they average everything out. Uh, look at that. Azir is OP. That's the problem they're having whenever they're managing the champions. It's a forgotten tournament these days for League players, but back then, IEM was a big deal. Sure. There were a few huge tournaments per year that weren't just MSI in Worlds, and in the case of IEM San Jose, TSM were the favorites. TSM had just come off making it out of groups at Worlds, and they even took a game off of the eventual world champions in Samsung White. One of the EU teams who were present just got promoted out of the minor leagues and they were hungry to prove themselves, the Unicorns of Love. They stood no chance of beating TSM, or so everybody thought. Their jungler Kikis would pull out an ultra rare Twisted Fate jungle in the first game of the semifinals. Checkmate. This worked because the season 5 jungle was the most broken clear of all time. I bet that a lot of you who have played League for a while now know that the jungle has more or less always had a patience system. It's pretty punishing in the new jungle for season 13 as the camps have a very small leash range. Yeah, true that and then they made it even smaller, so that's kind of cancer. The way that the camps worked back then, though, is that pulling them out of their leash range would only mini-reset them, as they had a very generous limit to their patience, up to 10 soft resets before the camp would fully reset. So as long as you constantly re-grabbed the aggro and didn't exceed the 10 resets, you could barely take any damage at all from jungling. When I say that this was crazy to see at the time, it's a bit hard to put it into perspective in 2023. We've come such a long way in this game, and junglers have mastered their clear speed so well over the years, that this doesn't look crazy hard or impressive at all these days, but the community back in late 2014 had never seen anything like this. Yeah, that's the point I made in one of my previous videos when I was saying that the skill level has dramatically increased in the past 10 years or so. Bro, I started playing in Season 3. In Season 3, Season 4, Season 5, Freezing Wave was the other thing. Watching Insect do Insect things was f***ing insane. That jungle path thing was unheard of. Now? It's a casual day in f***ing bronze and f***ing silver. I shoot you not, bro. When was it? That was last night, no? Or two days ago. I was playing in Iron, of all the places. In f***ing Iron, I had Lee Sin Jungler who casually was performing insect. He would gank mid, though, he would flash over enemy mid laner, he would kick him into me. I ran. Bro, back in the day, only challengers could do that shit. So you know, the skill level has increased, just saying. You have to understand and remember, given the context, there was no practice tool. We didn't have the things that we do today in order for players to become better at the game. The ganks for this TF were also very good, as his flash gold card to pick up first blood on Bjergsen is incredibly iconic. That would snowball the matchup slightly in the favor of Power of Evil, and there was no looking back. For the rest of the game, Bjergsen got completely blasted, featuring multiple solo kills. This game would put UOL on the map, and they were a great contender in Europe that year. Players like Power of Evil, Chachi, and Hillisang have all had great careers. For my money, when it comes to the strongest champions we've ever seen, relative to the rest of the field, you are looking at probably the best champ ever. If somebody wanted to argue that Release Callista was the most OP champ we've ever seen, I think it would be reasonable. One thing you'll notice right away is her dash was insane. Just how ridiculous the kiting looks. She is able to completely backflip all over the enemy, and in an age where very few champions had any mobility like this at all, she was deadly. Simply going through the patch notes might give you a better insight to just how broken Callista was. On patch 5.4, they needed to increase the duration of her windup. It was too quick, and it was OP. On patch 5.9, her dash used to give increased range when dashing backwards, and it was removed, because it was OP. 
Patch 5.13, she lost an animation cancel with her Q where she was able to cleanly cast it during her dash, and that was changed because it was OP. Also on 5.13, her autos were given a straight up 10% damage nerf. Callista got an ARAM-esque change since she gets to jump after every auto, and that's OP, I guess. On 5.17, W passive nerf, R cooldown nerf. Patch 5.22, dash speed is now reduced by attack speed slows. It wasn't before this, and they thought that that was OP. Looking and now look into today's scenario, what we have. Every single new champion has a dash, another dash, a stun, a 360 wind wall, a f***ing another stun, health region, invisibility, a parkour over the wall. You can have a teleport, as that's all basic. But back then only Kalista had it, and Cassidy. Yeah, that's about it. Only two champions that had that thing. Now everyone has it. So imagine they would nerf Samira like they nerfed Kalista. Just imagine. Looking at this list, you can't even call these adjustments anymore or minor tweaks. You can't just say that Kalista was simply nerfed because that's not what happened. Release Kalista was quite literally a different character than what many of you know her as. She is the original Zeri. She was the first champion that Riot made that was at such an overwhelming and problematic state, they had no choice but to tune her down about 50 notches. Also this should be one of the default report hit. Man, no, probably doesn't happen often enough. So you gotta. Yeah, yeah I feel like it is done, Keys Voice. Just type it in. Pick Bard. And uh, the space where you land on it and you give all your stars to the other player, that's Bard. If Season 5 was known for its hilariously broken champions that were absurd like Callista, it would also be known for its failures. Let's talk about Bard. Oh, I cannot brother. properly describe to you just how bad Bard was. You know how when brand new champions come out, sometimes they hover around a 40% win rate, players are still learning the champion, and it makes sense. If the build and runes aren't fully optimized yet, they're going to underperform. If a champion introduces new mechanics or something complex to the game, players will need time to adjust. This is why Riot needs to be cautious about buffing brand new champions, and typically I don't think it's that big of a concern if a new champion has a bad win rate. Also we have to take into consideration that back then, I just realized it's rather a new thing where Riot's client, where the game itself is telling you what you should build, what runes you should go with, and what skills you should level up in what order. Basically, we have the game of fucking autopilot, like Raid Shadow Legends. You click the button, autopilot, everything is already selected for you. Back then, we had none of that. So you would go with the wild runes, you would go with random builds, you would max out the wrong ability. So naturally that the champions in the very beginning had low win rate. Now, bro, Riot is just giving everything on the pillow, you know? But in the case of Bard, all of that could be thrown out the window. You are looking at potentially the weakest champion ever. You know he's bad. I know he's bad. Let's be honest here. We all know this guy is pretty bad. His list of buffs following his release is still hilarious. Look at this monster list. Buff after buff after buff after buff. In total, I counted over 25 different buffs from March 2015, which is when he came out, until March 2020, the day he was nerfed for the first time ever. Bard was so bad, so underwhelming, and so weak that he was buffed for five full years after coming out. Nice. That is most likely an unbreakable record. Sometimes champions are bad for unintended reasons, and in the case of Azir, it's because he was incomplete. Azir was not released in Season 5, he was actually released towards the latter half of Season 4, but it was only his alpha version. I know that Viego and Mordekaiser are the two kings of bugs, I understand that, but when I think of bugs, the first champion that comes to mind for me is still Azir. With Azir, it's not really to say that he had a bunch of bugs. I wouldn't even call it that. He was so buggy to the point that he wasn't even properly tested. That part in QA where Riot tests their champions to make sure they work, yeah, they didn't do that, all right? He still holds the most infamous bugs ever, in my opinion. For example, he could completely break the game and spawn infinite turrets, making it straight up impossible to beat him. His soldiers could farm Jace's acceleration gate. Let me repeat that, just in case you missed it. He could farm champion abilities. This is because many things in League are actually coded as minions. Even if it doesn't look like it, Jason- Easy as 396 gold, by the way. But just remember, at the end of the day, what we have to understand is that this company has a 200 years of collective game design, so they know what they are doing. It's not a bug, it's a feature. This gate in the code is technically just a line of minions. Nice. If you thought either those were game-breaking, how about the fact that his ultimate could just turn off turrets? You know, as you do. It's pretty simple, really. 
Azir just did not work. They did not test him. They released him as a little goof, a little gaff, just a prank, bro. <laughs> Perfect champion. <laughs> Honestly, if Riot would release a champion like that today, I wouldn't be surprised. In one of the first patches of the year, a huge change came out of nowhere. This <sighs> Bro, we just had a good time. I was laughing. Why am I crying right now? Why would you remove the fire grasp? That was my favorite item, bro. This would become a meme for years. RIP DFG. The removal of Deathfire Grasp is still breaking the hearts of many veterans, yeah. but it was the correct choice from no. Riot. There was a serious lack of counterplay as the item gave you enough burst to completely obliterate any squishy champion. Not just squishy, bro. I was one-shotting tanks. I was casually one-shotting tanks, and there was no counterplay. Exactly the reason why I love this item. The three biggest abusers were Ari, Vagar, and LeBlanc. Yep. LeBlanc and Vagar are understandable. LeBlanc will pop you during the chain, Vagar hits one cage and you get destroyed. Honestly, not too different from normal league stuff still in 2023, but the Ari might surprise you. Ari is definitely a different champion in today's game than she used to be, and she's gone through a lot of changes. Nowadays, she's more of a low damage utility kiting mage, and a large reason for that is her recent mid scope update that gave her resets on her ultimate, a lot more healing, and removed the damage amplification on her charm. What's interesting though is that this is not the only time that Riot tried this. Ari's modern day version is actually not that different from her season 5 version believe it or not. Back then the most common Ari build was to rush a DFG and if you landed one charm on the enemy they were basically 100 to 0 every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you land the charm that's all it takes. It doesn't matter if you're in front of the opponents, the same goes for LeBanc and the same goes for Vagar. But for Vagar and LeBanc I was playing only Vagar and LeBanc, you would need a chain or a charm or a cage if you are standing in the bush like we like to camp and they have no vision if you see enemy walking towards you dfg q ultimate that's it that's all it takes it doesn't matter which champion it can be labong it can be vagar sometimes with vagar you can skip the q part you can just press dfg ultimate all it takes the two forms of damage amplification combined for a highly mobile assassin with a strong cc ability and riot essentially told us that this was never her intended gameplay pattern so on the same patch that dfg was removed from the game, Ari also got a rework, removing the damage buff from her charm and giving her a lot of utility by having her Q grant a large burst of movement speed. At the time, this was a beautiful example of just how wrong players can be about changes as the way that many players reacted to both the removal of her core item and her charm getting nerfed is that she would be rotting in the gutter. Ironically, she instead became the best champ in the game. Her win rate shot up as high as 56% as her new playstyle of kiting with the Q was nuts. You could throw the Q behind you coming out of base and get back to lane faster, almost nobody could catch you, you could escape ganks, and the- Yeah, because everyone was expecting that you are still the old Ari, which goes in, stays in the fight, and then pieces out. This Ari was straight up cancer. She was just poking you, running away, poking you, running away, poking you, f***ing running away. That was cancer to deal with. Charm was still always useful. 2015 was a historic year for Faker. After winning Worlds in 2013, SKT failed to make the tournament the following year, and they were forced to sit at home and watch Samsung White dominate their way to a championship. Korea was still on top, but it wasn't SKT. This season, Faker would end up splitting time in the starting lineup with Easy Hoon. Easy Hoon was a solid and consistent player that performed better than Faker on certain champion picks. Often the team would sub in Easy Hoon if they wanted to play a specific draft, and this angered some fans, confused some others, and even had some saying that Easy Hoon should be the full time starter. In the finals of MSI, SKT would go head to head with EDG facing off in a legendary series. They would start by playing Easy Hoon, and after going down in the series, Faker would come in and force a game 5. EDG would win that final game with a brilliant strategy of counterpicking Faker's LeBlanc with Morgana mid lane. And although they lost, SKT would learn a lot. Morgana mid lane into LeBlanc. Oh my god, sounds like cancer to deal with. Jesus Christ, that's a nice counter, not gonna lie. Because every single time you are using your distortion, you're using chain, Morgana goes with the black shield. If you are jumping, Morgana can go 50 50 with the dark binding. Either she's going with your old location of your distortion as LeBlanc. Or she's going straight towards you. Oh my god, such a cancer, bro. From this tournament, as Faker would assume the starting role most of the time from here on out. 
At the 2015 World Championship later that year, SKT would make a dominant run and end up winning the title. In their 16 games played, Faker would play in 12 and Easy Hoon played in 4. Something interesting though is that throughout the entire year, they had the same winning percentage with both mid laners. Across the 83 games that Faker played, SKT won 81% of the time, and nice. for the 42 games that Easy Hoon played, they also won 81% of the time. It wasn't just the controversy around the starting job that made this season so interesting for Faker, it was also the picks. Here is one of my favorite stats of all time. In 2015, out of nowhere and for seemingly no reason, SKT locked in Master Yi mid lane for Faker. Twice. Keep in mind, this wasn't some early season AP Master Yi. This wasn't a situation where Master Yi mid lane had been seeing play in solo queue and other pros were trying this and Faker had been spamming it. This was random, yet a run of the mill AD Master Yi build picked in the mid lane and they won both games. Yeah, now we're talking about season five being broken. No, 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 no. AP Master Yi was broken. Feel like that was season two, season three. No, that was it was broken. And then after winning both of those games, they never picked it again. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what this was about. Clearly, they would plan around it because it in the was first game, about sending the message. That's all there was. Marin played Morgana top for extra utility, and the entire team would gank mid and put resources into it. They basically dove the Urgot on cooldown, and Faker didn't have to do anything special because it was a huge team gap. If this were just a one-off situation, it would be more understandable. But what's confusing is that after they did it again and it was successful, you would think they would continue trying to at least draw out some bans or something. But I guess not. Apparently, Faker will just have to settle being undefeated all time on Master Yi. 2-0, baby. <laughs> Look at this screenshot. It looks pretty normal, right? I mean, it just looks like old league, nothing. I need to move my camera. Yeah, now I remember this cancer. Yeah, your creeps, your score, and the score of the game. Two out of the ordinary, but those of you with a keen eye might notice something slightly off about this. Yep. And that's because this UI did not exist for a very long time. During the summer, Riot would update the heads up display. Most of you recognize the old UI when it looked like this. It's nostalgic and just truly looks like old League of Legends. However, when this update came through, the biggest thing that changed is that the top right of the screen had absolutely no information. Instead, everything was tied to the minimap. The kill score, your KDA, and the in-game time were all attached right here. Such I think Riot did this for a couple of reasons. Most likely trying to reduce screen clutter, and probably to get the player base to look at the minimap more. All of that sounds f- Uh, screen clutter idea is nice, but realistically, if we're looking at the sweaty silver, sweaty gold players who want to be next challenger, who have no idea of how to do it, so they are using third-party software, such as Portal Fester and whatnot, which literally even add more shit on your screen, such as your CSM minute, summoners, when they were wasted, objectives, how many uh, gold did you earn per last minute, how much gold you earned in total, was the team deficit, and cancer like that, which takes straight up like a third of your fucking screen. So yeah, the screen's clutter is not ain't that fine on paper, but players did not initially like these changes, and after a few weeks, Riot took notice. The screen clutter problem has never been a real issue. Exactly. I honestly believe the game has always handled user interfaces very well, so they ended up reverting it and meeting players halfway. Nice. They would update the graphics but move things back to their usual place. Also during this time, the font was quite different for a bit there as well. Maybe this is me just overreacting, but I very much agree with reverting some of the changes. These numbers and cooldowns honestly look bad to me, but I'm sure I could have gotten used to it. Also when you think of Aram, you think of the Howling Abyss. It's the snowy map set in the Freljord that gives the mode its iconic look. But what if we played Aram somewhere else? Originally introduced during Season 5 for the Bilgewater event, along with the rework of Gangplank, the Butcher's Bridge was a variant of Aram with all the standard rules. There were some pirate theme changes that made it more fun and immersive, and I remember thinking to myself at the time that this would be fun if they rotated the maps. It was f***ing amazing. Map was beautiful, theme song was beautiful, announcer pack was replaced by Gangplank. And the background song was, uh, hold on, where's that? Pretty sure we can find it real quick. And the background music, Bilge Water, there it is, there it is, there it is. Hold on. This shit was the music. Maybe yes, there it is. I want to cry. That was the music in the background. A 
and I'm pretty sure this uh, th that was the uh, background art for the loading screen. But that was good. Right, right, right. We've got we've got a couple of minutes. Let's just let's just chill a bit. Shit was so good. No one to play Gangplank or Pike, same LML. Shit was so good, but it was so fucking good. Both three played in here. Hold on, let's go here. Kind of reminds me of the Akai Arrival song in the Kung Fu Panda. Actually, yeah, fits the bill. Fits the bill. This music, I feel like I want to take, build a boat, and start trading some villages. You know? Let's see what the expert says. The experts are saying, who makes this music? Why is this stupid? Uh, exactly. Village water map needs to come back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think the best event happened to League was the Pilchwater event. The story had made this expanding upon the champion background was absolutely amazing, yeah. Because the wick killed Gangplank. Progress and finally Peter revealed Gangplank only for him to be killed by Misfortune. Yes, sir. Misfortune's whole story. And then he came back. And then he came back. Shit was good. Oh, shit was so good. Anyway. Maybe one month Aram could be on the Howling Abyss, and then another month it could be on the Butcher's Bridge. Ultimately though, Riot would only briefly use this one or two more times, and we haven't seen it in a very long time. It's yeah, what's up with that Riot? Where's the map? Where's my map? Incredibly odd to me to see them work so hard on putting something out there that's super cool like this, and then just leave it to rot. I'm sure that a lot of the community would love to see this more, even cool. if it's only temporary. There was a persistent issue throughout the entire year of 2015, which is that laners were taking Smite. It all started after Riot would rework the jungle enchantment for tanks. Originally, it was called Juggernaut, and it wasn't very good. Essentially, tank junglers were not seen in the meta because all of the other options were simply better. When it got changed into the Cinder Hulk enchantment, everything would go nuts. Most pro games would feature a full tank Nunu versus full tank Rek'Sai, or even full tank Gragas. The item was crazy efficient. In fact, way too efficient, because for a couple of months there, we would see Smite top lane. Hecarim or Shivana would go TP with Smite top, and they would spike very hard on this Cinder Hulk and Red Smite combo. The best part is that the story doesn't even end here, because once again there would be another jungle item rework. The AP jungle item was also quite weak, so Magus was eventually reworked into Rune Glyph. Oh yeah, the Ludens one. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, I remember that. You had Ludens before Ludens was a thing. And if you played back then, you'll remember Smite mid Ezreal. This is one of the shortest lasting OPs in game history, as this was insanely strong for like three weeks, and then we never really saw it again. Rune Glaive was an interesting item because it actually converted your Sheen attack into fully magic damage, meaning that Ezreal's Q, which normally does physical damage, would do 100% magic damage. It also gave a small but meaningful AoE that would help slightly with wave clear. If you're not sure why converting the attack from physical to magic damage even matters, it's simply because your penetration items would get more value. AP Ezreal has always worked as an off-meta build, but you wouldn't get a ton of value out of Sorcerer's Shoes or Void Staff since those only give magic penetration. He's always had good AP ratios that are ready to use, but it's never been meta because he always works better as an AD champ. This is one of the few times where his AP build was stronger in the meta than his AD variant, and I had a lot of fun playing it during the time. Clearly though, it was not balanced and was promptly nerfed. I feel like we need to play a bit of Ezreal again. Our final topic today is the Season 5 World Championship itself. This tournament will always be controversial. 
Riot admitted after Worlds that they learned a lot from their mistakes, and they ruined the competitive integrity by reworking and changing far too many things right before it started. What do they mean by ruining the competitive integrity? Well, the meta for the tournament was completely different than the summer season, the one that the teams qualified on. Within just a couple of months, there were six major reworks. The four juggernauts, where Mordekaiser became a bot laner that summoned the dragon and Darius was unbelievably busted, and also the Gangplank and Fiora VGUs, where they took over the meta right after they launched. There's a good reason that new champs and reworks are essentially disabled for at least two months in pro play, all thanks to the horrendous goof from Riot in 2015. At the end of the year, League of Legends officially moved into the modern age. We had the new UI, the updated map, all of these splash arts got reworked, and Season 6 saw the introduction of the first ever Keystone Masteries. Masteries, now called runes, were made to feel more impactful, more important, and meta-defining. Season 6 also saw the removal of many items from the old days. Crystalline Flask became Corrupting Potion. Refillable Potion was added to the game. Sword of the Occult, which was the old AD Magi's equivalent, was yeah. completely removed. And of course, Mana Pots were retired. My heart, my soul, Mana Pots. Bro, anything but Mana Pots. The difference that one year made for this game was off the charts. The end of 2014 was still very much the old League of Legends, where the game was in its golden years, the days that the veterans remember. However, just 13 months later, Season 6 resembles something that is at least recognizable today. So what do you guys think about Season 5? Without question, it's the craziest season ever, with the most changes to the game in the shortest amount of time. Let me know in the comments down below, and if you enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe. Thank Yo. you very much for watching, and I hope you all have a wonderful summer. Yeah, now that he put it this way, yeah, it's craziest in the amount of changes we had. Yeah, literally we had the fun old league, and then we were getting our new stepstones into the new league that we're playing right now. Yeah, but craziest league! Season 2, Season 3. Hands down, Season 2, Season 3. You go Master Yi middle, you build 5 Rabadons. You press Q, you win the game. That's all you need to know about those seasons. Anyway, that's the video.